importante. We're all good. <laughs> oh, great stuff. Oh, there's lots more people that's joining. So hello to everybody that's joining. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Hi Isabel. So we've just got a few more minutes in there. Everyone, you can pop a message in the chat and if you just make sure it's available to all panellists and all attendees, everyone can see it as well. Looks like a very interesting picture in the background, Jack. Is it Shetland? Yeah, it's two puffins swimming underwater. It's oh. actually, I did a bit of a, an art hack um, going back to the art theme. It's just a tea towel I framed. But it's quite, it's nice. It's really nice. It's, I used to live up there. I used to work on Fair Isle Bird Observatory. Wow. Um, so yeah, it was just a little bit of a, an ode to that, really. And puffins. I mean, who doesn't like a puffin? Who doesn't love a puffin? Exactly. <laughs> Stunning. Oh, Tracy says it's far too nice for a tea towel. Yeah, you wouldn't know it's a tea towel. It looks like a piece of art. <laughs> yeah, it's a beauty. Mm. I think it's a screen print. And then yeah. I just put a little a cheeky hen harry under there just because you have to. It's hen harry day, isn't it? I like these emojis that people are using of the, um, very cool. I know, I don't know how they do it, far more technical than I am. Have we got, have we got some birds of prey in the emoji mix? Yeah. I think we, you said, is it, I could, it's very, very small, but it looks like a, a, a vulture or an eagle. Nice. Mm. Yeah, I don't think my eyesight's good enough to tell what it is. <laughs> Uh, we've still got people joining, Diane. It's just two o'clock, so should we give it a couple more minutes? Yeah, we can do. Just a couple more minutes. If you're waiting and you've got questions that you think you'd like to ask, you can always pop them in the Q&A section. Um, they might be answered during the session, but if you want to get ahead of the rush, <laughs> get questions in the Q&A. Oh, Jessica's told us how we can do the emojis, so thanks, Jeff. Probably far too advanced for me. Do it, I think she's taunting us. It's just like, go on edit. I don't even know where you go on edit. <laughs> Computer wizards. No, I think we need to be under 20 to... Yeah. Okay, shall we, shall we make a start then, Di? Okay, hello everybody. So uh, just to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. We can't see your faces and the only people you'll be able to see on the panel is me, Diane and Jack. Uh, later we'll be doing a Q&A section where you'll be able to ask your questions directly to Jack. So um, like Diane's just mentioned, if you want to start popping them in there, that would be lovely. Okay, so thank you for joining us. My name is Danielle and I work for Derbyshire Wildlife Trust um, and I'm super excited to be hosting this Bird of Prey webinar. I'm now going to hand over to Diane Gould, our very own People Engagement Officer um, and Jack Ashton Booth, mm -hmm. um, Investigations Officer at RS RSPB. Okay, so over to you, Diane. Hello, it's lovely to have everyone back again if you've been before or new visitors as well. Um, so we're going to start, as we normally do, with a little bit of the chat and our quiz. Um, and then Jack's going to talk to you for a little bit about some of the work he's done with Hen Harriers in the past. Um, and then we've got an activity for you. Um, with a bit of luck, you'll have all had your activity sheet before you came. And it did suggest that you um, bring along um, tape measure. You've got one, ruler. I've found another way to measure it if you can't to grab yourself a tin can in a minute we'll give you time to do that later um hello louise day um, um and then after that then we'll have the q a section so as i say all the way through if you've got something that you think oh, i'd really like to know the answer to that just pop it in the q a section and we will try and answer as many of your questions as possible but we're going to start off with um just discussing basically what a bird of prey is because this is something that um, children have often asked me, not even just children actually, um, and not everybody is completely aware of it. So the term birds of prey is one that's used for birds that catch their food using their feet instead of their beaks. Now again, we sent out an activity sheet before the session 
and it was suggesting that you spend a bit of time um, looking at birds in your garden or on your street and just having a look at the garden birds and then comparing them to pictures of the birds of prey so that you could sort of try and work out what it is that's different about birds of prey and what maybe birds of prey have in common. I don't know if any of you managed to do that or you might even just know the answers. And if you do, you could always just pop some of your answers in the chat to see what, what you happen to notice that was different about the birds of prey. Um, but essentially, I don't want to give the answers away in case anybody is, doesn't want to type it in. Nobody seems to be typing, so they're all busy writing long, long answers to me on the differences. So we've got a picture of a bird of prey there, and you can see um, its feet. Okay, birds of prey tend to have um, very powerful talons and powerful beaks, unlike the garden birds. We've got, oh, so somebody's given a good answer. Birds of prey mostly eat warm-blooded food. Oh, that's a very technical answer. I like that one. Nice. Yeah. Um, and then you can't tell just by looking at them, but they've got very acute, in other words, you know, sort of highly developed hearing and sight to help them find their prey as well. And they're kind of like the main differences between your garden birds and your birds of prey. In terms of which birds are birds of prey, um, I know there's sometimes confusion over owls. I think a lot of people have said to me, is an owl a bird of prey? So the term's actually used for two different groups of birds. We've got the raptors, like the falcons, the harriers, and also owls, which are birds of prey. Now, the two groups of animals um, aren't very closely related, and they developed very independently of one another. But they happen to develop the same sorts of features, these <clears throat> big talons, sharp beaks. Um, if you remember when, if any of you came along to the hedgehog webinar, we spoke then about how there's a few different animals that have got these spines and yet they all developed and evolved separately of each other. We've got the same situation happening here. They're not related but they've got the same characteristics because these features help them to survive. Raptors tend to be diurnal and that means that they're active and flying in the daytime and they have their sides sort of on either sorry have their eyes on either side of their head. Owls um, on the whole, not all of them, tend to be nocturnal and they have these forward facing eyes that set in this facial disc. Again, if you came on the OWL webinar, can anybody remember what that disc was there to do, what it helped them with? It's a very special adaptation that improves something to help them hunt. Um, owls also have slightly different feet to other birds. They have two toes pointing forward and two backwards, whereas most birds have three forwards and one backwards. But these are all birds of prey. So we've got a little quiz. We're going to play a game of who am I? Okay. So like we do every time, we've got a poll for you to vote on. And what I'm going to do this time is slightly different to our other quizzes. So I'm going to give you five clues out. Okay. And you're going to see if during these five clues, you can guess which it is. So the poll should pop up on your screens. If it's blocking the picture or anything, you can usually just move it to one side. And as I read the clues, see if you can guess which of those birds of prey that we're talking about. Okay, so here's your first clue. We form lasting pair bonds with mates and show strong loyalty to territories. The silhouette on the screen is also there to give you a clue. Second clue, I am built for soaring high in the sky. From below, you can see my broad chest, long broad wings, and a short tail that fans out as I fly. Anybody voting yet? Uh, certainly are. It seems like we've got buzzard way ahead in the lead. Oh, right then. Clue number three, you can find me around rolling grassy hills and near fields full of rabbits. I'm sorry, Diane, I just cut that a bit short. <laughs> Whereas before, I'm not a very good hunter, so I look for easy prey such as vulnerable young animals and also dead animals, something we call carrion. And the fifth clue is I'm not, I am the most common bird of prey in the UK. Well, I'm so, hoping you all got a chance to vote there. I cut it a bit short of my If you didn't get a chance to vote, just stick it in the chat what you think it is. That's a good idea. 
Okay. okay. So our, our choices were golden eagle, sparrow hawk, osprey, or buzzard. So buzzard right out in the lead there. Yeah, got some experts in the room. <laughs> Fabulous. Sally thinks it's a buzzard. Hello, Sally. <laughs> It's a friend of mine. Hello, Sally. He thinks it's a buzzard. Oh, loads of people are saying buzzard now. What do we think? Move the silhouette. Do you think that's a buzzard? It is. So the answer to that one is buzzard. Okay. Should we have the next one? Just bear with me a second. There we go. Okay, so again, silhouette there to give a little bit of a clue, but here we go. I am the third most common bird of prey in the UK. I can be found in all of the UK except the most mountainous areas. I hunt and eat mammals such as voles, mice and shrews, but will also eat worms and insects. I am slim with long wings and a longer tail than other UK birds of prey. Fourth clue, I can often be seen perched on roadside bushes and poles looking for prey. And the last one, see if this gives it away, if anybody's not sure yet. I have an unmistakable hunting method of hovering above fields to find prey, which I catch with my talons and kill with a bite to the back of the head. Think of the hovering, what do you think it is? Got a strong lead. Here we go, here's the answers. Oh, I look strong. Look at that. It is, you're right, it's a kestrel. Well, I suppose we should have seen the picture first, shouldn't I, before I said that. There we go, beautiful kestrel. Yeah, it kind of gives that one away, doesn't it? Well done. Okay, let's see if you can get the third one then. Hey, you've got that silhouette there for you. I am one of the largest of the UK raptors. In 1900, there were only five pairs of us left in Wales and we were extinct from England and Scotland. The introduction projects have boosted our population, our numbers, and now there are over 1,600 pairs across the UK. I have rather unimpressive talons and a beak for a bird of my size, so I tend to rely on scavenging dead animals rather than hunting and can often be seen soaring high over roads looking for roadkill. I have a recognisable shape when soaring in the sky. I have long wings with clear finger shapes at the tips and a deeply forked tail. But one last clue, how are they doing? They're doing pretty good, I think. Uh, Red Kite is definitely out in the lead. Okay, so let's see then, this might give it away. For local people anyway. <laughs> I've been missing from Derbyshire for 150 years. But I returned two years ago and nested successfully at Kettleston Hall. Yeah, definitely Red Kite then. <laughs> Shall we share them? Yeah. Go. Look at that. Nice. There we go. Ninety-two percent of people thought thirty-five out of thirty thought it was a red kite, and you're right. Yeah. I love red kites. I went to see them in Wales. There's a place where there was just like, like you know uh, lots of them all together. It's very beautiful. That's definitely worth going to if you get a chance to. Apparently, they're not feeding them at a regular time at the moment because they're trying not to encourage large gatherings of people. But it's definitely yeah. worth going to when they are doing again. Yeah. Oh, and there's loads of red kites in Surrey and Essex these days, says Sally. Hilton Hills is also a good place to see them. So we're getting all the good spots now. <laughs> okay, next one then. My intelligence and ease of training made me popular with falconers that led me to be known as the King Falcon in the Middle Ages. I'm a bird hunter, I catch them in flight and will take small to medium sized birds. In flight you can see my long wings bent close to my strong stocky body to make an anchor shape with a square tipped tail. I'm happy living in towns and cities and can be seen, big clear here, at Derby Cathedral where thousands of people follow our nesting every year. And if you don't know already, ah. Uh, Fast, agile and showy in flight, I can reach speed of 200 miles per hour when I dive for prey. And it makes me the fastest animal on earth. Wow. Well, we've got a clear winner again. <laughs> I think we, uh, we get a good couple of clues there, Diane. Here we go. Peregrine again. 
Well done, everybody. Well done. Be doing pretty well on this. Okay then. So we've got two more to go. Okay. Okay. I live in upland areas such as moorland in the summer where I nest on the ground. I search for prey by flying low over the moors, floating with wings held in a shallow V shape. The male and female of my species look very different. Females and young are brown with clear tail bands and males are soft grey blue with black wing tips. At one time people thought we were two different species. I'm often known as Sky Dancer because of my beautiful acrobatic flying displays when I pass food to my mate. People are so worried about us and the fact that we're being kept on the verge of extinction <clears throat> that they've made a whole day about me to celebrate my beauty and spread the word about my troubles. Oh, there was a little bit of a, a goshawk hen harrier battle going on, but it seems oh. to have uh, <laughs> changed yeah. it a bit. I think the last two clues should have given that one away. All right, I'll share this. Here you go. Hen harrier for go. Billy in the end. Yeah. All right, it's a hen harrier, which we're going to hear more about in a little while from Jack. And Carol, Luke, and Poppy have been to a Hen Harrier Day, which is maybe a good time to mention. Saturday this this week is Hen Harrier Day, all online this year. So there's loads of stuff that you can get involved in and do. It's worth having a look to see what there is. Right then, last one. Let's see who can get this one. Special sure to clues this one. I'm not actually a UK bird of prey, but I've been visiting the country very recently. It's the first time I've visited Derbyshire, the second time I've ever visited the UK. Did I get this one? <laughs> I normally live in mountains such as the Alps. I'm not a hunter, instead I scavenge food from dead animals and particularly enjoy eating the marrow out of bones. I have a huge wingspan of 2.8 metres. Who can get that one right? Wow, I think everybody's done a pretty good job. There you go. Yeah. Look at that. So how many did you get? We gave, there were six different birds to guess there. How many did you get right out of your six? Let us know in the chat. Let's see how you did. I think we'll have had some pretty high scores in that. Oh, look, Steve got six. Carol Logan probably got five, five, another one there. Great scores. And I know that Yasmin actually, who got five there, she actually sent us in a piece of artwork for our art production. So um, that's lovely of them. Five, oh, got lots of people getting five, all of them. Five out of six. I think you all birds are prey experts and you don't really need to be here. <laughs> yeah. But we're glad you came. <laughs> Luke has got six out of six as well. Brilliant stuff. Can't work. Yeah. We've all done an amazing job. So next it's going to be over to Jack to talk to you a little bit about the work he does. Uh, thanks ever so much guys, thanks for having me and it's lovely to have you all here to hear a bit about the hen harrier. Um, so I work for the RSPB investigations team. Um, I've been working with them for just over two years now. So I started my life working with hen harriers um, under the LIFE project um, and now I've gone into investigations full time but still a large part of my job is um, with hen harriers which are like one of my special favourites. Um, and just a little bit about this slide, so you can see myself there with an injured red kite, which we kind of, well, we rehabilitated and released on that day, which was a lovely thing to do. Um, and just to the left, there's an action man there with a, a raptor on his arm. And that was, with that and the golden eagle, which was a stuffed golden eagle, um, as a child, these were the two things that uh, captivated me about birds of prey. I had an action man with a, a, a bird of prey on its arm, which I was obsessed with. And then the golden eagle, which was a taxidermy specimen of my brother's friend, his father. Um, I'd go in and it had a little plaque on it, which said, please do not touch. And as a young, small boy, I was the first thing I wanted to do was stroke it. And I used to get told off constantly for stroking it. So it was these two things that really got me involved uh, with birds of prey. And ever since I've been hooked. So the next slide. Uh, so this is a little video of the hen harrier. So this is uh, the male and the female together, and this is 
for the male has sky danced and got himself a female partner and they, they, they tend to nest. The female sits on the ground and incubates the eggs. And you can see the male there, he just chucked a vole. And then the female came up and begged it. And then mid-air, the female takes it and then drifts back to feed herself or to feed small chicks. And the male, he's, he then goes and flies off to repeat the duty and just repeat, repeat, repeat and provisions her until the young chicks get to a, a big enough stage where the female can leave them during the day and feed them, and then the male and female can feed them both together. So if we just watch it again, you can see the male's with the vole, he chucks it, the female does her acrobatics, and takes the vole. That is incredible. You can hear the snipe in the background there drumming. Well, that's that weird little noise. Um, so this is the hen harrier. So this is an upland specialist. Um, sadly, there's not a good population left in England. In Scotland, they're fair and okay. In Wales, there's about 40 to 60 pairs. In England, it just gets into double figures, sadly. Um, and this is something, you know, as a collective, as conservationist, as passionate enthusiastic, enthusiasts, this is something we'll all change together. Um, so, as Diane mentioned in the previous slides, this is the shorted owl. And you can see from this picture, the, the, that orbital disc, that ridge around the eye, funnels that sound into the bird's ear. And the hen harrier is a very, very similar species and occupies this very similar niche as the, as the short-eared owl. So they're both upland specialists. They both breed on, breed on the ground. They both have big, big brood sizes because they rely heavily on the short-tailed field vole, amongst other things. Um, and yeah, so it's, these are very similar birds, but very different, as Diane mentioned. So the bird on the left, or, or the, the, the grey bird with the black wingtips, is the male hen harrier. Um, and the bird to the other side is the female. So this, these are both adult birds. You can see how beautiful the male is. So he's the sky dancer. So he'll do his roller coaster display and he'll keep doing it in a, in a perfect bit of habitat, usually an upland moorland or could be soft Russian on a foul side or in a valley. And he'll just do it and call away and he may even spin on his back and go underneath and he'll chitter. And then the female will make, maybe like they'll pair up. She might think, wow, he's absolutely beautiful. And to us, they are absolutely beautiful. But some of the female harriers are picky. Um, and then they have to have a really good male to, to pair up with. Um, so yeah, you can see the, the male, as is the case with a lot of raptor species, is smaller than the female. So their wingspan tends to be around one meter so the male's just under one meter and the female's just over one meter. Um, and this is called size dimorphism. And this is a thing with raptors whereby they can occupy a larger, they can take larger prey, basically, a larger spectrum of prey. The male can take smaller things like small birds, small mammals, whereas the female can take rats on the Isle of Man or rabbits on the Isle of Man as they do. Or they can even take uh, red grouse, which, they, which gets them into some conflict. Um, so these are these are the male and female, and these are both adult hen harriers. Uh, so yeah, it's going back to aging them. So a female tends to be called the ringtail, and the ringtail is a phrase or term term used for the female type. It's the type phenotype, so the the female looking bird. So here, this is a young bird, so you expect them to look like females because it's all to do with their camouflage. If they're in the nest, they need to be dark and cryptic, as, as the female is the same. When she's incubating those eggs and incubating the chicks, any predators going over the top or a fox walking through the heather, she needs to be as quiet and as dark and cryptic as possible to blend in. Um, so it's essentially evolution as they age. So the young birds will eventually get brighter and more colourful with experience. So the younger and more naive you are, the more camouflage you have to be. So this is the ringtail and they're called ringtails because you see those absolutely beautiful bands that basically encirculate the tail. They're the rings. So if you keep that in mind, the, the rings around the tail, if they have those rings, that's a ringtail. The minute they turn into the adult male, which is the ghost silver, beautiful plumage, they're no longer ringtails. Um, and you can see the big, beautiful white rump. It's like Daz white rump there at the base of the tail. That's a really diagnostic feature of a lot of harriers, but hen harrier especially. Um, and 
the, this is a ringtail and then this is an other ringtail. So this is a female and a male, but as you can see, the bird with the satellite tag, um, just with a bit of gray and that beautiful yellow eye, that's the young male. So he is going from that cryptic camouflage we talked about um, as a youngster, and then he's transferring, he's sort of evolving into a ghost. So you can see he's got a few lovely male ghost-like feathers coming through in the wing. He's got a beautiful golden eye and a beautiful gray nape, which is just coming through. So it takes them about two years to develop into a proper gray bird. So what they do is they molt the feathers as your cat or your dog might molt the hair. Um, the birds will molt the feathers and develop into an adult bird. Whereas the females will tend to stay like that. They may get a bit more colorful, a bit more rufous in the underwing and a bit more gray around the head, but never to the extent of males. Um, and you can notice the young female there has the dark eye and the male has the golden eye. And as the females get older, then they develop a, a brighter eye. So when they're both adults, they have golden irises uh, akin to the short-eared owl. Um, and this is the wing formula. So if you imagine, if you take your hand and count your fingers, so you've got five fingers on your hand. So the hen harrier is very unique in the sense it has five fingers. So the outer finger for the bird, which is the furthest away from the body, is number 10. And as you count in, it goes from 10 to one. So you can see, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, they're the five fingers. So whenever you hear anyone say, oh, it's a hen harrier because it has five fingers, that's what it denotes. So the other species of harriers, your Montague's harrier and your pallid harrier, and they'll have four fingers because they lack, you see where it says P6? That's the inside finger, they lack that. So they basically have four fingers rather than the hand. So that's a really good memory, for your memory, hen harrier with five, pallid and Montague's four. Um, and this is a bit about hen harriers on the nest. Uh, as Diane mentioned, they're ground nesting species. So they tend to nest on the ground, which does make them vulnerable, um, but they have ways to, to get over that, going back to the cryptic camouflage. And then you see they've lined their nest with like the grass and nesting material. So they might take bracken, they might take, you know, the thin uh, millennia grasses, and then they line the nest and make it essentially a lovely little cup warm cup which traps air and keeps the eggs warm when the egg is laid originally it's like a lovely pastely blue and then over time as the female sits and incubates those eggs and they develop they become whiter like your teeth um, and then in time the nest starts off really clean like that and then the small bits of down the female preens she'll line her eggs with that down and after about 30 days which is about a month the eggs start to hatch and there can be clutch size from two eggs to seven eggs. Believe it or not, I was explaining earlier that this year when there's lots of voles around and the species thinks, oh, we can breed, we can have lots of chicks and they can go off and spread the gene pool. Um, they can have more chicks. So this year I amazingly visited a nest and it had seven eggs and seven chicks when I visited the next time, which is remarkable. Um, and that tends to be an indicator of how well the voles are doing. So you can see these young ones here there. The smallest one there is about two or three days old and the largest one is just about a week. Um, and but at that time you can't sex them. So we, we're none the wiser other than that they're baby, cute, adorable hen harriers. Uh, this is going back to the eggs. So as the ground nesters, they can be vulnerable to predation. And sadly, this was a nest that was predated by a fox, but I put this on just to illustrate how blue they are especially on the inside of the membrane of the egg. You can see it's like a almost pastely blue and then they develop into that white color. Uh, unique, very unique. Owls tend to have white eggs, whereas other raptor species tend to be quite camouflaged, whereas hen harriers, they rely so heavily on the birds sitting on the eggs. They don't really need that crypto camouflage on the, the, uh, the, the eggshell. Uh, so you can see they're the, the same chicks as they develop. Voles are brought to the nest, they assimilate into protein, the protein then they grow into larger chicks. These are about 21 to 25 days old. Um, sadly, they tend to lose, if they have a big group of seven chicks, they may lose some of the weaker ones, or the older birds may eat them, or the adult bird may even eat them, but sadly that's just nature. Um, and we get to this stage and we can start to sex them. So we can sex them on the, the size of their legs, so we call this the lower leg or the tarsus, Females tend to have a big solid tarsus, 
and the males, as we went back, as we referred to before, are smaller and spindly. They're like, like a pencil. So they tend to be thin. Um, and they have, going back to the eye, the males have like a lovely grey cast into the eyes, whereas the females are dark. The females are larger, have a big skull and a large beak. And the males tend to have a lovely little thin colman um, and a small head, little compact head. So at this age, between 21 to 25 days, we can ring them. So the females take an F ring, the males take an E ring. Um, and then we know what sexes they are. And then we know when we come to tag them, uh, what tag is going to be deployed on the next, next, the next visit. So just, just going back to what I explained, there's the female there with the dark eye um, and the, the little male there with the little brown eye. If you can see in the iris, like we have a blue or green or brown iris, the female has an all dark iris and the male there, he has a, like a, a gray iris, a cast into his iris. He has small little bright yellow legs, really spindly, spindly leg. And he's a much smaller bird. Um, so he weighs much less than her. Um, and uh, through time, you can see that when they're together. So if you're ever fortunate enough to see them together, you, you get a real illustration of how small the males are compared. And they're really buoyant. They're almost turn like when they're flying around. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, so this is the tag. So the tags are small little, essentially small backpacks that fits as a harness as you would as you walk to school or wherever. Um, and there's a, you can see that antennae. That antennae basically speaks to satellites in the sky and the satellites then speak to our computers and tell us where the birds are. And the small tag, so they're about 10 grams, about 9.5 grams for males and about 12 grams for females. Females being the bigger bird can take a bigger tag. They have a small little uh, like a solar panel on, so they charge from the sun and then they, they beam out a transmission to the satellite and it tells us where they are, uh, where they're roosting, whether they return to breed the next year, if they've got a nest for themselves. Um, so yeah, they can tell us a whole lot about the bird and the beauty of the tags is they tell us about the character of the bird. Some birds just stay and some birds move all over the place. So these are some of the movements. So you can see this is the UK here and uh, the near continent. So you can see these, the long arrows, uh, so the long movements, the light blue and that dark blue, they're males. And amazingly, they, they, they tend to leave. A lot of our young males tend to leave in the winter when it gets cold and harder to find the meadow pipits and the bowls. So they'll, they'll leave in, over the English Channel into continental Europe, into France and into Spain. And believe it or not, we had one into Portugal this year, which we'll, I'll come to in a second. You can see some of them from the Isle of Man population go over to in, into Ireland and west coast of Scotland go into Ireland. Um, and then the Scottish birds tend to drift down into northern England. Um, and that crazy one at the top um, was a, a sad loss of a bird that went the wrong way, sadly, and, and fell deceased into the sea. Uh, so this is Thoth. This is a, a is like close to my heart, this male. So he, he uh, basically was tagged as a, as a young chick in Scotland in summer 2018. And he decided, I'm not going to England, I'm not going to France, I'm gonna go over to Ireland. So he went through Scotland into Ireland and he wintered in these amazing lush peat bogs in Ireland. Must have found some beautiful prey and some lovely winter in habitat. And then he came back to Scotland um, and drifted down into Northern England and just summered. He didn't breed for his first summer. He just molted through and just got, he made the most of the voles and thought, I'm just gonna look after myself, pamper myself. And then he went all the way back to Ireland. And then he wintered in roughly the same places. And there's a lovely man over there called Barry who monitors uh, Ireland's hen harry population. And Barry went and saw Thoth and monitored Thoth. And apparently he wintered in one of the coldest, coldest winters and he survived amazingly. And thank goodness he did because he came back this year to Scotland and had chicks for himself. And that was all part parcel of the tagging process. And why we do it is to understand where they go and find their nests and then go on to tag their chicks to learn about how they all, how all these populations are interconnected. So yeah, that's Thoth. Um, and these are just two illustrations of migrations. Jack, I don't think we can hear you. Oops. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we're back. Yeah, if you just want to start from that top of that slide again, that would be brilliant. Yeah, no problem, of course. I think I must have hit space accidentally, sorry. Um, so yeah, tornado, he, that's, one, that's one absolute mammoth movement in one day. So he had a tailwind, 
and he just went for it. Beautifully settled sunny weather with a tailwind and he just went for it. And he went from Northern England all the way down to the South Coast and taxied basically near Portland Bill. So you can see in one day, the tag just shows us these distances they cover. So he's just traveled down the backbone of England. Um, and Apollo, this was a movement he's done from essentially Lancashire all the way down to Portugal. And that was in his first winter. So he never even knew anything existed outside of Lancashire and ended up in Portugal, which is remarkable. And then he came back and uh, he bred for the first time, which was amazing. Um, and the, another thing tags illustrate, and this is the sad, sad part of my job, because I'm like you guys, I just wish to celebrate life and look at this species, uh, is the death and the mortality. So this is illegal persecution of birds of prey, illegal pers persecution of hen harriers. So the x-ray there, the radiograph, you can see those small white, the white, the large white uh, object is the ring. The small white objects, which are the circular, they're sh pieces of lead shot, which have come out of a, sh a shotgun. Um, so sadly, tags illustrate this, 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 this does occur. Um, and this is a female hen harrier, the other picture next to a wood pigeon that we recovered in Ireland, which had uh, flown over from the Isle of Man. And sadly that bird was poisoned. Um, yeah, so these are some of the things the tags show us. Um, and it seems to be, there seems to be a correlation, the evidence suggests with the shooting industry and this species, the hen harrier. So this is something we, we you know, all of us wish to conserve is and protect this species from. Uh, so for yourselves, obviously you've, you've heard me bicker on about raptor species, you're probably sick of me anyway, but I'm just so enthusiastic about these birds. So just to try and sort of impart that onto yourselves, the best way for me, I mean, is just to take notes. These are some illustrations I did about the common buzzard, which, you know, it's nothing rare, it's nothing special, but they're like really, they're one of my favorite birds because they're easily, you can just go out and see buzzard. So just take some notes and everything you can take, your illustrations and your, your drawings, you then can apply to other birds of prey. And eventually when you start to see these patterns in one species, when you apply it to another species, it becomes like everything's just a rule of thumb. It becomes a pattern. So these are some kestrel wing formulas. This is a lesser kestrel and a common kestrel. And although they look very similar, if you learn what I taught you about the hen harrier and the feathers, 10 to, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and then apply it to other species, it will become more obvious. So just take some notes, take some photographs and just write and just learn basically. It's the best way. Um, and another thing that fits into learning, and so you guys can carry this forward, is uh, feathers. So obviously prey remains from raptor, raptor species. Um, just have a look. So like, there's a peregrine feather there and some woodcock feathers. So these are all I took from peregrine kills underneath the cathedral. Um, some species are protected by uh, Schedule 1 and the Wildlife Countryside Act. So just be careful when you approach nests or, or their territory. But if there's a, a cathedral nearby, which is clearly accessible by people and the peregrines aren't bothered, just have a try and collect feathers and look at, look at the species they're killing. Because it teaches you about birds of prey and their natural history and other birds. Um, and likewise goes with pellets. If you can understand what they're eating, you can learn more about the species. Um, and it, you can just carry this forward into, you know, your raptor working into the field. Because you're in a good position, you're young and you've got good knees where a lot of the raptor workers I work with uh, tend to be quite old and wish they were like, you know, 10, 10, 15 or 20. So yeah, you've got time ahead of you. So, you know, learn, learn, learn. Uh, so yeah, it's just a little illustration of myself there out in the field, go out and learn. The best way is just to watch and make notes. And then if it's raining and it's windy, webcams, the fantastic nest cams, nest, you know, uh, peregrine nests, buzzard nests, red kite nests, and you can see what the adults do. You can see how long they incubate, what the chicks are doing, how they develop. So on those rainy, wet days, once you've done your homework, or if you haven't done your homework, that's the best way of learning. Sit at your screen and just watch them and make notes. That's all I can advise, really. And this was uh, the bearded vulture. I think a question's just come in. Have you seen the Lamagaya? I haven't seen the one in um, Derbyshire or, or when it paid a visit to Yorkshire. I'm hoping to, but... This was my first ever uh, bearded vulture in India in the Himalayas. And as you can see by my face there, I'm uh, somewhat overwhelmed because they are absolutely incredible birds. 
great picture as well. Yeah, that was, my, that was my friend Tim's photo. That was because I had all the settings correct, but I was shaking that much from adrenaline. It just went out the window for me to get a photo. So. Oh, that's a great picture. Oh, that was lovely. Thanks, Jack. Um, I'm sure that's probably conjured up lots of questions as well for later. So uh, again, if you want to start putting your questions in the, the, the Q&A section, that would be great. And then Jack's going to be um, answering those for you very shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. All right, Diane, over to you. Sorry, I'm... the dog was barking. <laughs> um, right then, we've got a little activity for you, a bit of a break maybe from looking at your screens and I think sometimes it's a bit hard to um, sort of gauge how big these birds are. And often when you see them, they're flying up quite high. You can't really tell. I have been very lucky. I've seen the Lamagaira. I went a couple of weeks ago and saw it in Derbyshire. And we could appreciate it was a big bird. The distance it was away from us. I know, lucky me. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> from the distance it was away from us, it's hard to appreciate just how big it is. So we're going to do a little bit of measuring. And we suggested that you bring along the tape measure or something to measure with, but I appreciate that everybody might not be able to lay their hands on one. So I've also come up with a method for measuring using what I think everybody will have in their house, which is a tin can. Taking the label off mine so we're not advertising. But I've measured it and tin cans, which are a pretty standard size, are just short of 11 centimetres. So, um, Danielle, if you don't mind putting on to the next slide, We've got a table there which shows you the six birds that we had in our quiz earlier, in the Who Am I quiz, and it tells you their wingspan in centimetres as well. And I've also worked out the tin can equivalent. So that is, if I were to lay seven tin cans in a row, that would be the same size as the Kestrel. So you can measure your own wingspan. If you stretch your arms out, you might need somebody to measure it for you, or you need to be very um, adept at stretching it out, marking it. I have already previously worked out mine and I worked out I was just a little bit smaller than a red kite. Ah. <laughs> so you can, my, I am about one meter 60 in my wingspan. So I'm between a peregrine, falcon, buzzard and a red kite. Okay. If you measure from fingertip to fingertip, see how big your wingspan is and see if you can find out which bird is the nearest to you. If you have to do the tin can method, it's moving along, counting how many cans you have to lay next to you to get your tin can equivalent of your wingspan. So, have a little measure, see what you can come up with. Oh, your mum is a peregrine. Fabulous. And uh, let us know in the chat, as um, Luca and Poppy are doing already, which bird of prey. Hulk is probably a bearded vulk. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that is a question, isn't it? Which is bigger, the Hulk or a bearded vulture? <laughs> There's one for uh, for debating and good and working out. And maybe while we're letting people do that, I can remind them again of Hen Harrier Day. I think you should, Diane. I I think so. so if you've been interested in this, if you want to learn more about birds of prey, do pop along to Hen Harrier Day on Saturday. Um, it's all online this year and you can learn absolutely loads from it. Um, they have their own website if you want to find out about that. Well, you can check on our website as well for information. It tells you more about Birds of Prey, more about um, Hen Harrier Day. And it also tells you about our fabulous art auction, which you can pop on and maybe bid on a lovely piece of artwork while you're there. Right, with few people, Ben is slightly bigger than a buzzard or a peregrine. Heather has the wingspan of a hen harrier. That's a good bird to be the same nice, as. Nice. Louise is between a peregrine and a red kite. Jenna and Deb, I am just bigger than a peregrine. Samuel is a little bit bigger than a buzzard. You've all got quite big wingspans there. Mm -hmm. I think we're definitely getting the older children watching this as opposed to the younger ones, I think. Lucas, I am one can bigger than a peregrine and a buzzard. Thank you for using the can method. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great method, Diane. Yeah, it's genius. Yeah. Actually, we could maybe use this more widely. What's your tin can equivalent? <laughs> um, ben and Anna, peregrine. So I think it's just quite interesting because yeah. it's very hard to gauge how big they are. I know after we went to see the bearded vulture, I sort of worked out that the height of my children 
if we lay two of them next to each other, like head to foot, head to foot, they they were pretty much the same. Wow. Wingspan of the bearded vulture. So just by doing that, it made us appreciate how big this bird had been that we'd seen. Yeah, when you see them in the sky, I'm sure though when you see the bearded vulture, you'll probably do, you know, really feel how big it is. But perhaps when you see a buzzard, you don't really you know, get a feel for how big they are because they're so far away. But just uh, visualising, you know. Uh, it's hard to tell. I suppose a lot of the time when we're looking at them in the sky, there's nothing around that we can compare it to. We're just yeah. looking at them in the sky. So there's nothing to relate it to. So we've got a few more here. Nico is as big as a hen harrier. And oh, Sally's saying it makes you appreciate the huge wingspan of these birds. Um, Callum and Michelle, 137 centimetres. I'm a peregrine falcon. <laughs> Well, you could all go around now saying what bird you are, so I think that's fine. Um, don't forget, if you've got any questions now that you'd like to ask, pop them in the Q&A rather than the chat, and um, I think we'll move on to the, the question bit now. Is that okay, Danielle? Sounds good to me. Okay, so we've got a few questions in there. Jack, are you ready? Already. Okay. Um... Go easy on us. <laughs> okay. Ben and Eleanor, um, if you want to come and ask um, Jack your question, that would be great. Are you there, Ben? Yes. Hi, Hello. Ben. <laughs> ask your question then. Um, how big is a golden eagle? How big is a golden eagle? Wow, that's a great question. So yeah, the, the female golden eagle is absolutely massive and the male golden eagle is a bit smaller. So the golden eagle, if you can imagine a common buzzard, you, you're familiar with common buzzards, Ben? Mm-hmm. So a common buzzard, I'd say a female golden eagle is probably three common buzzards in length. And the males may be two common buzzards, maybe a bit bigger. Excellent, thanks Jack. You had another question, Ben. Did you want to answer, ask that one too? Oh yeah. What is the most common bird of prey in the Peak District? In the Peak District? Common bird of prey is probably the kestrel or common buzzard, I would say. Because common buzzards have had a, uh, nationally have had a large expansion <coughs> following, they were, they were, the populations were low in the 1970s and then they've progressively got better nationally. And now as a result of it, the common buzzard and kestrel are always sort of comp competing for popularity. Oh. Is that actually a question, Ben? Yeah. That's um, right. Thank you. Thank you. She's a bit shy to ask. She wanted to know how you work out which bird is in the, when they're in the sky. Is there's any way you can work out which bird of prey it might be. Oh, can I butt in here quickly? Because <laughs> um, I'll give you a more detailed answer, but we are sending out a sheet afterwards that helps you identify some of the silhouettes. So hopefully you'll get a chance to practice with that. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Ben and Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jess, would you like to um, ask your question? Oh, you just, there you go, Jess. We've got a weird question. Why, yeah. why, why are some bird young naked? So I guess what they're asking is why, why are they born with um, very little, very little yeah. coverage? Yeah. yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so essentially, because they're, they're dependent on their, their, the adult or the, the, the bird that's rearing them, the they have a brood patch the adult bird has a brood patch so essentially it's a, a part of the body that's missing the feathers it's usually more pronounced in females and what it is is it's essentially where the feathers are missing it's just skin with really dilated blood vessels large blood vessels so when they press against the young chicks the heat is transferred that way so the young some of the birds can be pink when they're really really small because they're getting that heat through the adult bird through the female um, and then progressively, as they get older, they develop better down to insulate themselves, to keep themselves warm. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Jess. Um, okay, Steve the Tyke. Um, if you're there, Steve, if you want to um, ask your question.
Hi, Steve. You just want to unmute. Mm, I've got a feeling that um, he can't do it because of the, the, the settings he's got on Zoom. So I'll ask his question if that's okay um, on his behalf. So is the vulture likely to return as a British bird? Uh, it'd be lovely to think it, it will in time. Um, in terms of the bearded vulture, in terms of colonisation of the UK, what happens is, is that the Alps population and there's a Pyrenean population. And as we were discussing before, with the young birds, so they're believed to be from a self-sustaining source now. So in time, when there's more youngsters in the gene flow, um, if if the birds then move further and further and closer and closer, it, it, it we have to see because it's so unprecedented ground that in the future, if a few birds start to do it, they could easily you know move into areas you know such as the Peaks, Cumbria, up into southern Scotland. I mean, essentially they'll be feeding on sheep and uh, sheep and deer carcasses because they rely on bone marrow. Um, so there's there's no problem in terms of the prey. It's just more the habitat and whether it sustains them, you know, in terms of the, the scale of it. If you think of the Himalayas, the Pyrenees and the Alps, they have some seriously big mountain ranges. So the support's there, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Great. OK, thanks, Ben. Um, Callum and Michelle, um, if you would like to ask uh, Jack your question, it'd be great. That just that bit where we have to wait to see if it's worked. Like, are you there, Callum? How old does a buzzard get? How old does a buzzard get? Uh, that's a really good question. So they actually can be really long lived. So I know some buzzards in captivity can be into their mid twenties. Um, so, but in wild, obviously, there's more pressures in terms of there's a lot of stress in the environment and they've got to fend for themselves they're exposed to cold winters so you probably a good old buzzard would be between 15 and 20 years in the wild yeah. which is amazing to think isn't it that you could be seeing the same buzzard as it grows next you know in in the neighboring plantation in the, in the neighborhood could grow grow alongside you you've seen as a kid so. okay thank you you're welcome thanks Alan. Um, okay, Heather, are you there to ask your question? I wonder what's something pass system bird them going straight, flying straight forwards, not going in a diagonal like a falcon. Oh, the fastest, the fastest in straight flight, direct flight. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, peregrine falcon are pretty. It's all to do with how their, their way in which they hunt and how much muscle they have in direct flight. So peregrine falcons are probably up there, but then if it's all relative. So if you look at the Merlin, it's probably really fast in direct flight. So this is a bird that's, you know, com well, you know found in the Peak District. It's a nice little species. The male's really tiny. It's one of our smallest raptors and the female is a bit larger and they're super fast falcons so in direct flight they'll probably take it as well they'll be as fast but yeah it depends on it depends on the bird and how fast they and what they're chasing but a great question great stuff thank you um jenna and deb are you there to ask your question mm. Are you able to unmute, Jenna? No? Okay, I'll ask on your behalf. I don't think your mic's working. Um, how many black kites are there in the wild? How many black, oh, in, in the UK? Yes. That's a good question. Well, it's not, it doesn't say in the UK, it just says how many black kites are there in the wild? Oh, they're one of the most, like in, in Asia, they're one of the most numerous raptors species. So for example, Going back to the beard vulture I saw in India, in India it's remarkable, some spectacles of black, black kites are everywhere, absolutely everywhere, because the red kites used to be exactly the same in the UK, so back in the day when they would scavenge, you know, and the, and the, san, the sanitation of the UK was, wasn't what it is now, they would scavenge on all the carrion and the offal, um, so black kites still do that in other countries, so they tend to be really numerous, so yeah, if you're watching raptor migration, you know, whether it's in Spain or in Italy, the most numerous species tend to be black kites as they migrate to Africa. I didn't even know there was a black kite. I know the red kite, 
So yeah. yeah, so they've just started to really take a stronghold in the UK. Uh, they've just started to get more regular. So bird watchers are really excited because it looks like with, you know, some species are doing well with climate change. Black kites, it really does seem like they're going to benefit. And it, it, I wouldn't be at all surprised in the, in the near future if they colonise the UK. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting, Jack. Great um, question. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Jenna. Um, okay, Pam, are you there? Go on, Pam. <laughs> if it asks you to unmute, if you just want to unmute. Ah, uh, no, okay. Um, so she's asking, uh, is the bearded vulture in Derbyshire male or female? And it's uh, actually, it's from Ruben, the question. It's a good question. I personally can't say anything about that, to be honest, because it's, it's, again, going back to seeing birds in the sky, it's all relative to, to what birds you have to compare. Um, there are tricks of the trade and like, I don't know whether, in time, as the more and more it preens and the feathers come off, eventually one of those feathers will probably get sent off for testing and DNA would probably not only highlight where the birds come from, but what sex that bird is. It'll be really interesting to find out. Yeah. Because in species like in species of the red kite, believe it or not, it's believed that the females tend to do a lot of the ranging in, in the spring. So whereas in the hen harriers, the males shoot left, right and centre looking for females. Mm. Uh, in the red kite, it's believed that females do a lot of the dispersal in the spring. Um, so with the bearded vulture, it'd be interesting to know whether it is male or female to see why it's come across the channel. Yeah. I mean, if it's a female, then it's essentially, you know, ready for a male to find. It'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Sally has got a really interesting question. Um, so I'm hoping she'll be able to ask. Hi, Sally. Oh, hello. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> grown up dude. I hope that's okay they're all children anyway um um i just had a question about fa like falconry displays and birds of prey experiences and things like that which are wonderful but i always wonder is that something that the rspb sort of promotes or do, is that is that helpful to conservation of birds of prey or is it detrimental and what's the kind of what, what what's your thoughts on that and um, yeah, great question it's it's, 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 it's very view. mixed really um so the RSPB, it's the same for all of us. If it's, if, it's, if it's conducted ethically, then there's not a problem. If it's conducted by, by the law, you know, legally, it's absolutely not a problem. And with regards to a lot of falconry centres, they do a brilliant job in terms of mm -hmm. conservation efforts for species that are, you know, struggling globally. Um, so yeah, if it's, if it's by the book and it's by the law, you know, we've got no real issues. Yeah, and they, would they be, would they, would they be, taking those birds from the wild or would they be breeding them uh, so a lot of them will be breeding them um mm -hmm. and obviously we do know which we've seen for ourselves birds have been taken from the wild illegally mm -hmm. and therefore like my job as an uh, sort of i'm an advisory role in my job to assist the police so if if that comes to my knowledge then i'll assist the police in best dealing with that and if they've got the permits mm -hmm. to take them from the wild and it's done legally, then that's you know justifiably by the law. So, we'll, it's case by case okay. basis. We we'll take it. But yeah, thanks, mm. Sally. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, I've got a really good question, but I can't find. It's from Carol, Luca, and Poppy. I'm really struggling to find them to be able to connect them so that they can ask their question. They, they did put into the chat before that they might be losing their internet, and thank you all. Oh. What doing shame. the session well i'm going to ask that question because i think it because we're just about to uh, come to the end of this session i think it would be a really really good um question to to end on um so they, what they asked was is how do i get a um get to do a job like yours jack <laughs> just from i don't know how i do my job and sometimes i pinch myself like i get i get paid to do it some days when hen harriers are here flying around my head i think I'm nothing special. If I can do it, anyone can do it. I think it's more, if, if, if you just learn and love raptors, it's just passion that takes me, I think. So just write notes about birds of prey, collect your feathers, look at it, share it with everyone. And you know, you, it will take you places. That's, that's all I can say. So. Brilliant. Um, well, I've got a quick question if I'm allowed to ask it. <laughs> um, you said that they, they lay their nests on the ground. 
why do they do that? Because I naturally, before you told me that, I would assume that they would, uh, you know, roost in uh, trees or, or nest in trees. Yeah, it's a really good question. So some some hen harriers do actually nest in, you know, in the the small spruce generate regeneration plantations. Occasionally, they have nested in small, really short, stubby growth of trees to give them a bit of extra lift from terrestrial predators. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think it is to do with that's probably why they can come into conflicts in areas because they're the ground nesters, um, and it's just if you think about the, some niches like the woods will be taken up by goshawk, so goshawks are a you know a phenomenal predator on the moorland fringes, so if they were to nest in the, the into the woods they might get predated. So they found their niche where you know the short-tailed field voles or meadow pipits. The easiest way to do it would just be to nest on the ground and the male can come and go and feed you see what i mean so there'll be there'll be an absolute reason for why they're ground nested yeah. because that vacuum hasn't been filled so they're fill it it's the same with the short-eared owls and that's why the owls especially ground nesters are so cryptic camouflaged whereas the species that nest in trees they tend to be a bit more brightly colored more vibrant if that makes sense yeah it makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's a bizarre one i mean that's the thing with ground nesters they're exposed to the weather they're exposed to foxes and badgers it, it does make you wonder but it's clearly the niche they occupy yeah yeah it's a good oh, one thanks jack well that just about brings us to the end of uh, today's webinar so um just want to say a huge thank to jack for coming over and sharing all of his experience and his stories it's been really really interesting and I'm, I've got a feeling it will have inspired lots of uh, people as well and lots of children to go and um, yeah, find out more. So thank you, Jack. You're and welcome. Diana, do you want to just plug, um, you know, uh, the Hen Harrier weekend again and the, uh, just so that people know what's again happening this weekend? Yeah, totally. If you want to learn more about birds of prey or if you want to learn more about some of the issues that are affecting them, it's definitely worth popping on Hen Harrier Day online on Saturday. Um, there'll be... Um, loads of different things going on there. It's presented by Chris Packham and Megan, and um, they'll have lots of different activities. If you, even if you look at their website, there's already things you can get involved with there. There's crafts projects um, that you can do, and we, as part of it, are running an anonymous art, art auction. Artists have donated pieces of art for us to auction off to raise money to help birds of prey. Um, and if you go on our website. And look up Hen Harrier Day, all the information's there. If you can't bid on it yourself, you can tell somebody else who can bid on it. Um, and hopefully we'll raise lots of money and help a lot of birds prey to live a long, happy life. And we've also got another webinar um, this evening at 7 pm for um, it's more of an adult um, theme, so uh, it's not perhaps more uh, it's fam family friendly, but um, yeah, just to let you know that's at seven o'clock tonight and you can um, yeah, be on oh, and the next. The next um, family webinar that we're doing is in two weeks today, I think, is it the 27th? Yeah. Um, three weeks. Um, and it's all about badgers. So yeah. sign up for that one as well. Great stuff. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Thanks, Diane. Thank and thanks, Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye. Okay.